Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to, devote to worship this, this weekend, this celebration of Pentecost, uh, the 50th day after Easter. Can you think of times when ambiguity in language is used in a useful fashion? Now, there are obviously ways that intentional ambiguity is a is a problem, right? I think of the phrase, uh, mistakes were made. Like, that's an ambiguity of, I'm trying to dodge responsibility. I don't want to acknowledge that there's a problem. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ambiguity where the, the language, the way we use language, either captures the multiple meanings and intends to capture them. I'm thinking of, um, maybe one example would be when we're talking about marriage, there's that language in Genesis 2 about the husband shall leave his parents' household and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one. And if you had to ask, like, how do the two become one? Is that a, a social, a fiscal, an emotional thing? The answer would be yes, all of the above. On multiple levels, the, the, the fact that it's, not, it's a little bit ambiguous there is, is a good thing. It allows you to interpret and understand that the two shall become one is functioning on multiple levels. And, and the Hebrew language um, actually uses that intentional ambiguity on a, on a regular basis. Another example of, of this ambiguity and what we're going to be focusing on today is what happens in uh, the very first verses in Genesis. We read that when God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Different translations capture this a bit differently. Some another translation says, when the earth was welter and waste and darkness. I kind of like that one. All right. Over the face of the deep, we read, God's ruach hovered, and God said, let there be light. This formless void, uh, welter, waste, darkness, deep, like all these words are trying to get at this like chaotic thing that we, we just have a hard time comprehending. And we read that across the face of that, ab above it, so to speak, not in it, not part of the chaos, but sort of above it, calling out, calling order out of that chaos, we read is God's ruach. And I, and I use the Hebrew word there because I don't want to necessarily choose which word uh, to translate it as because there's an ambiguity there. That word ruach, it can mean spirit. The spirit of God was moving across the face of the deep. And that is true. The spirit of God was moving across the face of the deep. But it could also be breath or wind. The wind of God was moving across the face of the deep, calling it to order. All right, and so which word is the best translation there? Were spirit or breath or wind? And the answer is yes. And if you think, just think about what happens next. We read that God speaks. And what, what is a word? Like when we speak, that is, that, that's breath, all right? You exhale breath, and breath, if, if, it ex, if that movement of air, movement of air, it, it's also wind, right? And it moves, and when the wind blows, things are, are moved and changed, and when God breathes, and this, the, 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 the world is created. And so breath, and wind, and spirit, they're all kind of, they're all there in that word. And to pick one, and say, now oh, that's the, the translation, kind of abuses the, the text, so to speak, because it's, it's, it's all of the words at the same time. I think the best translation would be that the, wor the, the breath slash spirit slash word, and our breath, spirit, wind, all of those words there, because the God looked upon what happens when God's spirit, like the spirit of something, like you think of like the spirit of something, the, the meaning of something, and the breath and the movement that causes something to happen, and then God looks upon what happens and says, yeah, it's good. When the, when the Spirit moves, this goodness begins, the goodness begins, began when God's words begin to be spoken. And we have a sense of, of how words create, because we have experiences of them in our own lives. When we hold up a child and say, we baptize you, 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, that, and when that child's baptized, they, they're now part of the family. Like that creates family. Before, this is a child, and isn't that wonderful? But now that child is part of the church, part of who we are. That's amazing. Or in a similar way, when a couple stands in front of the altar and the church is gathered and and the pastor announces, I now announce to you that if you are husband and wife, let no one put asunder what God has put together. Like, that's it. Those words. Up till that point, it's two people. You say those words in that context. Let this be the body and blood of Christ for us. We, We do that every Sunday. In a secular sense, we hear those words when when a jury comes back and declares you are guilty or you are not guilty. Like those words change what's going to happen next. So we have a sense of the way that words change and create, and and that's what's happening here. God's words are are moving. The breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God are are wrapped up such that the word of God is now creating everything that is. And as this happens, as the wind blows, as the spirit moves, there is this, this sense of direction. I often think that uh, one of the ways we talk about the spirit of God is it can come off as sort of chaotic. Like the spirit moves and like you never know what's going to happen. And that's, that's true. Like you know, don't know what God's going to call you to do. But it's always in the greater context of the order that God is bringing to pass. If you, the beginning, creation was formless and void, welter and waste and darkness the face of the, the deeps, right? The darkness of the cold of the dark waters. And out of that, God creates a, a good order in an orderly fashion, day after day after day, light and then land and then creatures and humanity. Right? There's, an, there's an order there. And so when the Spirit of God moves, there is a directionality, there is an order, there is a purpose. And we are invited to be part of this, the creation of purpose. Again, going back to Genesis, the way that uh, humanity, Adam, humanity is invited to name the creatures. And, and then um, humanity is, in, is tasked to keep and to till the earth to maintain the order. Right? It is our decision, thus, whether to work with the grain of the universe, to work with the order of the universe that God has created, to line up our actions where the wind blows. And, and the directionality here, where the wind is blowing, is from chaos to creation. It's not just happening once. The, the spirit moving is not something that happens in, in the beginning, and then it's done. That's it. We've, we've wound up. Like, there are images of God as the clockmaker. It winds up the clock and lets it go. And, and no, that's not how it, God is at work here. We see the spirit moving across the face of the deep. But we also see the spirit calling the prophets to speak when we who are tasked with maintaining and continuing this order, when we go astray, the prophets speak up to call people to back towards the law, the words, the, the spirit of God the, embodied in the laws of God, the Torah, that gives the people a way to live, an order of how they are called to live. The, <coughs> the spirit of God pushes Jesus out into the wilderness to face his own temptations and then the Spirit of God moves upon the disciples to gather them so that the, such that they will follow Jesus to learn and to grow. And today, we read on Pentecost how the Spirit of God moves upon the apostles before uh, the 12 disciples. Before Easter, they're called disciples. After Easter, they're called apostles. That's how the terminology works, right? And so the apostles, they're gathered together in the days after the resurrection, celebrating... <coughs> celebrating a Jewish festival called Shavuot in the same way that um, Passover, it becomes Easter for us. Shavuot is Pentecost. <coughs> and Shavuot was a harvest festival, the first of the grain that was brought in. But it's not just the harvest of the grain that is being remembered. <coughs> it's not just the harvest of the grain that matters here. And the description of how Shavuot is celebrated comes the description of how you leave the edges of the field unharvested so that the edges of the field are unharvested so that anyone in your community 
is welcome to, to them. So anyone who's willing to get up and put a little work in is going to be able to eat. And so Shavuot is, is the celebration of abundance, but an abundance that's not exclusionary only for some, but an abundance that is inclusionary. It's for all that would step forth to receive. And again, that's an, that's an order. That's a structure. That's a way of doing things. And on this day of, of Shavuot, the Spirit moves. And in that same spirit of the, the same sort of meaning of Shavuot, they're, they're sent forth to share. Like they have received the first fruits, the first grain, the, the, the good news after Easter. And now they're sent forth so that anyone who would hear will be able to hear what the, the good news of Jesus is. And so the, the, the spirit of Shavuot continues to, to drive them. And this amazing connection. In this direction, the wind blows, like as we notice, it's outwards. It is outside the, the walls of the building. It's to get them out of the walls and to go out <coughs> to people. Essential to the order, the prop process, the purpose of the, that God desires, the Spirit of God drives towards, is to go out. And so as the church is born on Pentecost, you call this today the, the church's birthday, so um, you could, and... Uh, what is essential to the meaning, the beginning of the church, is that the church is birthed as it goes out into the world to share the, the harvest. And it's this <clears throat> essential to remember this sense of, of going out and, and that the nature of, of what God is moving us towards, the kingdom of God, is, is that it is inclusionary. It is always inclusionary. It's inclusionary because we see when the spirit moves and the people go out, people don't hear Hebrew. The people go out, speak, and everyone hears in their own language. And, and everyone hears in their own language, and it's not that like everyone hears in their own language except, you know, those Egyptians, right? They don't hear in their own language. Oh, everyone hears in their own language. <coughs> it's just completely inclusionary. Everyone is welcome in the same sense of how Shavuot, everyone is welcome to have food if they'll get up and eat. Everyone is welcome to hear the gospel of Jesus if they will stop and listen. <coughs> It becomes essential to hear this, even today, because we are tempted today as they were tempted then and as we will always be tempted to lapse out of an inclusionary stance and to become exclusionary, to say this is who we know, even if it's not an intentional exclusionary stance, but this is who we're comfortable with, this is who we know, this is who we get along with, and this is who we're going to work with. And the Spirit is always driving <coughs> to create an order that includes more and more and more. <coughs> Allergies are bad this year. I'm sorry. And this becomes a challenge because there's always isms that need to be named. I believe there are still prophets, still pe people who are pointing out, led by the Spirit, pointing out where, where we need to see where the order that is is not necessarily the order that should be. Just because an order exists doesn't mean it is the order ordained by God. <coughs> Just a, and so, for example, even to this day, we there are, I listen to people and, and I hear about the various isms. For example, um, there's a person I know whose dad uh, is abusive to women. This, this dad uh, has abused multiple women, many women over the years, serial relationships. And, and these women have a support group uh, just of the women who have been abused by this one man. They have this, this ab uh, abuse so support group so they can help handle the scars from the abuse that they've shared. And, and I think it's honest to say that we do not take uh, the safety of abused women seriously enough. I think that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the order that we have today, and, and that's part of where, one of the places where our order falls short of the glory of God, it falls short of the kingdom, it falls short of what the Spirit would move us to do, which would be to inclusionary, right, to take care of everyone we can get our hands on, including women who have been the victims of abuse. I believe that 
we are called by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit in the direction of the kingdom of God, and that in the kingdom there are no isms, right? Just pick an ism, there's multiple of them. There are multiple ways the order that we have created falls short. And in this kingdom of God that is to come, we will be a family, a healthy family. Not everyone's family is healthy, right? A healthy family surrounding a table with the Father at the head, his son Jesus at his right side, and the, the Spirit amongst us moving and gathering and directing us towards an order that is healthy and good and just. In this kingdom, this rule of God, we see it wherever Jesus walked, and that's what we can hold on to. Like we know that's where we're headed towards, but we can see it in, in the way that Jesus lived. When, not just in what Jesus talks about, the kingdom of God is like. I mean, that's what he starts off a lot of his parables with. But just to look at how Jesus healed and ate with and listened and taught. Right? We, we gather today and in, in endeavoring to do the same. What we're doing is creating a place of this order where the Spirit is ordering our lives together. Such that here in this place, in this moment, we are an embassy of the kingdom of God. An embassy of a politics that will come, a politics that is inbreaking the kingdom where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what Pentecost does is it, it connects us both to the beginning, the order that God begins to create out of the formless, out of the void, out of the chaos, that, of the, the face across the face of the deep. And it connects us to where we're heading. It connects us towards the kingdom. And even when we veer away from that kingdom, even when we, we struggle, it is the spirit that guides us back to the words of Christ and, and directs us so that we can again gather repent and turn, turn towards Jesus, in whose name we are able to gather. Amen.